Hello and welcome. So far, we've been discussing the theoretical aspects of clustering. In this video, we begin to discuss the hands-on aspect. So let's start with the data set. You might have heard there are a lot of popular ratings for different colleges. It makes it easy for the learners or students to compare the colleges before they make a choice. These ratings would typically be based on the surveys conducted by different agencies where the students would have participated. So this data set talks about such a survey where we have different colleges. We have 100 colleges. Each college has a unique ID. And then we have these fields here, which capture the ratings provided by the students from these colleges on different aspects. So we have fields like teaching, how good is the faculty? We have ratings on infrastructure. We have ratings on research opportunities, industry interaction, placement, location, diversity, financial aid, and extracurricular activity. All these ratings are ratings on a scale of one to five. And for each college, these represent average rating. That's why you'd see some decimals here as well, because this is not just one student responding. This is an average of a number of students. In addition, we have two columns known as the airport proximity. This is the column. And one more column, which is the median salary in thousands of dollars. So we have these fields. And using this data, we are supposed to check if some of these colleges are more similar to each other and different from the other colleges so that we can make appropriate decisions as to which college needs what kind of support. And if you're a student or a person looking for enrollment, you can also get an idea about which are the best colleges, and which are the colleges you probably want to avoid. Remember, the output of what we're going to do would be just a pattern. It is not an answer or a value that we're getting which we are evaluating against something. It is just a pattern. We can look at the quality of our output. That's a separate piece. But we are not predicting any outcome. We are just exploring the patterns in the data. With this, let's get started. So I'm using Google Collaboratory, which is a free online access that anybody would have using a Gmail account. And I've already pointed my Collaboratory to the specific data set that we are interested in analyzing. I'm using a free type code because it will save a lot of time. So let's begin by importing the basic libraries like NumPy, Panad, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. Essentially, you'll see these are the common libraries that you need for most of the work that we do. And we're also calling warnings because at times that there are messages that appear regarding the update of packages and all. We're not really concerned about that right now, so we're just choosing to ignore the warning. Let me execute this. In the next line of code, we begin by reading the data. So we are storing it by the name of df, in short, data frame, and we are reading it through Excel. So it's a read Excel method, which is pointing to the exact file name, which we are willing to work on. It is recommended that whenever we read the data, we can inspect first few records, even though we've already seen the raw data, but it'll be a good idea to just bring it up here one more time. Right? So these are the same fields that we saw there in the raw data. Ratings on a scale of one to five, and the last two columns, which talk about airport proximity and median salary. Let's proceed by first checking if we have any duplicate records. So we can check the duplicate records by the specific unique identifier that's given to it. Since every college would have a unique ID, we are just checking the duplicates based on the college ID. And we are doing a sum of those duplicates. This value is zero, which means there are no duplicate college IDs in our data. We don't have duplicate rule. Now it's given to us that all these ratings are on a scale of one to five. But as a practice, make it a habit that you never just go by what's told to you with the data. You always go ahead and check whether that's right or not. So while these are supposed to be between one and five, we need to validate are these actually between one and five? And in order to do that, just written a simple code. So we are saying we'll go over each column in the list of columns. So this df.columns, when you apply this to a data frame, gives you a list of feature names. That's something which we are iterating over. We are saying for each column in df.column, we are checking if the value within a column is greater than five. We are doing a total of it. And we are adding to it if there are any values less than our scale was supposed to be between one to five, both inclusive. So if we have anything greater than five and anything less than one, we are just looking at the total count of those values. Obviously, the data is as it was defined, then this should not be a problem, at least for the rating column. We may see this as an issue for columns like college ID and airport proximity and median salary, which are not rating. So let's run this and check if our data is as it was supposed to be. Notice we have 100 values which are beyond five or below one in case of college ID, and so is the case with airport proximity and median salary. But this is totally fine because these are not the rating, and this is as anticipated. The good part is 
that those columns which contain the ratings are all between 1 to 5. And we clear on that. We could have also inspected this visually by excluding these columns like college ID, airport proximity, and median salary. So we can use df.drop. df.drop basically would remove those columns. If we, in addition, use something called as in place is equal to true, that will affect the original data. But if you don't write that parameter like in place is equal to true, it would just create a view for you without these columns. Access is equal to one because these are columns, and we are saying we'll directly apply the plot lib box plot on this. The labels on the x-axis should be easy to read, so we are giving it a rotation of 90 degrees. Otherwise, they may be overlapping. See, so this is how our box plot comes, and uh, everything looks okay. All the variables are on a scale of one to five, and everything seems normal, except for this one variable, which is called placement. This seems to have some outlag. Now, these outliers are not anomalies in this case. Anomalies would be the values that are unattainable. We agreed that we may have values from one to five, and this is well within that range. But within the column, these values are relatively different from the rest of the value. Now, we've discussed some of the clustering techniques are sensitive to outlier. So if we are talking about k-means clustering in particular, that's very sensitive to outlier. But the good part is that these values are pretty close to the boundary, which means the lower limit. So what we can do is we can easily ship them to the lower limit. That's a very common treatment known as flooring. Let's do that next. So how is the lower limit calculated for outliers? The general definition for the lower limit for a column is Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. What is Q1? It is the 25th percentile. What is IQR? It is Q3 minus Q1. So Q3 is 75th percentile and Q1 is 25th percentile. We take the difference between the two to get the middle 50% of the data, which is IQR. This is a very common treatment for outliers. So we are saying we just want to calculate the lower limit below which the values will be outliers. And whenever we encounter a value less than the lower limit, we will replace it with the lower limit. Else we'll leave it as it. So this is what we're doing in next two lines of code. First of all, we are calculating the lower limit for the placement column. If you see, it's exactly the same formula. We are using quantile 20.25, which means 25th percentile minus 1.5 times, 75th percentile and 25th percentile, the difference between the two. This will calculate the lower limit. We're just rounding it out to two decimal places. And then we are saying we want to check if we encounter a value less than the lower limit that we calculated, we will replace it with the lower limit. Else, we will leave it as it. This is something that we are doing in the placement column itself. With the help of a function called np.fair. Now, np.fair is equal to the if-else condition in Excel. So if a condition is satisfied, this option is executed. Otherwise, the default option is executed. Let's run this. And just to check if the placement column does not have outliers anymore, we can just visualize the placement column alone. So we are doing a box plot. We will be taking the y-axis as the placement values, and we are pointing to the data frame called here. You can see that now the column is free from outliers. By the way, we, since we are pointing to the data stores, we may avoid writing this df here. And it's your choice if you want to write it. If you, even if you don't write it, it'll be totally fine. It'll give you one and the same output. Yeah. So now we are sure that all the ratings related columns are in place. Since these are also numerical columns, it will be a good idea to do a box plot for these as well. So we are just checking the outcome. Okay, this column is not range bound like one to five, but it does not contain an outlier. That's totally fine. Similarly, so the median salary is something that varies between $40,000 to $120,000. And this, again, does not contain any outliers of now. So that's perfect. Now, there's one check that we are performing just to see if these columns have a correlation. You might be wondering, what is the need of checking correlations here? Because we probably do something else for correlations. So if you're following this video, I suggest you to comment, would clustering be affected by correlations? It's a little tricky question, and probably I'll create another video on that later. But... I, for now, just want you to think a little more on this. Would clustering be affected by the correlations? Let's check this. We're just setting the figure side, which is nothing but the output, and we are putting the correlation matrix, rounded up two decimal places, to a heat map. Now, we, we are doing annotations so that these values will be displayed up to two decimal places. We are giving a particular color map, which is cool, warm. Essentially, this varies between blue and red. And we're saying that the color bar that we get as an output should be between negative one to one, which is the typical range for correlation. Let's run this. And here is the output. So if you quickly examine it through the color bar, this extreme red would represent a strong positive correlation. And this extreme blue would represent a strong negative correlation. We don't seem to have very strong correlation. 
at least nothing to the tune of 0.8 or so is visible here, except for the diagonal, which is always supposed to be one in any case. This correlation matrix, as you know, is always a mirror image across the diagonal. So we don't have correlations in this data. Still, remember I asked you to let me know if you think correlations affect the quality of clustering or not. Search a little bit on that. piece. As of now, that's not a problem for this data set. So next, we know that clustering is typically distance-based. So it will be a good idea to have the variables on the same scale. Now, we have most of the variables on a scale of 1 to 5, except for the last two variables in our data, which are airport proximity and median salary. In this case, we can choose standard scalar or min-max scalar. The reason I prefer to choose min-max scalar here is because our data would not make sense as negative value. All the other values are on a scale of 1 to 5. Airport distance and median salary would not make a lot of sense as negative values. So I just go ahead with min-max scalar, but you can very well use z-scalar also. Another reason why I'm using min-max scalar will be evident in a few steps from now. Just bear with me on that. So we're calling the min-max scalar from the scikit-learn library's pre-processing module, and we are instantiating it. If I show you the head of the data, this is how it looks like, everything in the range of one to five, and these two columns on a different scale. So we don't have to scale the entire data. We don't want to change anything relative to the interpretation of the rating from one to five. That's pretty intuitive. And interpretability is also important. However, these two columns, which are on different scale, are the only columns that will be subjected to scaling in this case. So what we'll do is we'll select a subset from the original data, calling it as df sub, which contains these two columns. Remember, when we take subset of columns, we'll have to use double square bracket. That's what we have done. And whenever you apply a scaling operation like a fit transform, it typically returns an array, which would not have columns. It will be like a two-dimensional output with all numbers in it. So we are putting it to a data frame. Once we do the scaling, we get an array. We are converting it to a data frame and storing it by the name df subscale. Remember, the array would not have the column names, so when we create the data frame, we'll have to put the original column names as we had. Let's do this, and let's check the output. So see, this gives an output, but min-max scalar is something that gives you an output between 0 and 1 by default. It is interpretable, it is acceptable as well. Since the rest of the data in our case was on a scale of 1 to 5, it would have been really nice if we would have been able to get these two columns as well on a scale of 1 to 5. That will be very consistent with the rest of the data. Is that possible? Well, very easily. Let's see how do we do that. So midmax scalar apparently has a parameter called feature range, wherein you can decide the minimum and maximum value that you want to scale the data to. We are doing everything exactly the same way as we did earlier, except for this new input that we've given. And this would end up scaling our data on a scale of 1 to 5. So this is more consistent with the rest of the data. We can double check if all these values are consistent in a range of one to five or not by doing a describe operation on these two columns only. So you can see the minimum value now is one and the maximum value now is five, which is very good, right? At this stage, we are making a copy of the data frame so that we can remove the columns that we don't need, at least for clustering exercise. So college ID, we know is it's a nominal variable, would not really help with the clustering, and it does not contain duplicates, so we are dropping it. Airport proximity and median salary, we are dropping from the copied data frame so that we can bring the scaled variable. Remember, we took only these two columns separately, and we have this df subscale, which contains these two columns. So we don't need the original unscaled representation of these two variables, and we are dropping these. We are dropping these in place from the copied data. Why did I copy the original data frame? Because we don't want to be making too many changes in the original data. We want to keep it as is. So when we have to drop columns or make some changes, we prefer to make those permanent changes only in the copy data frame. Once we are done with this, so we can see that this copy data frame contains all the ratings related variables that we originally had. Yes, we have removed airport proximity, median salary, and college ID. But for our cluster analysis, we would need the scaled form of these two columns, which we can always concatenate. So we are calling it DF treated, which is the final data which has been treated for outliers, treated for scaling, and we are concatenating this copy data frame with these scaled columns. This completes the data preparation. As of now, we have all the columns which are containing values on a scale of one to five. In the next set of videos, we'll apply specific clustering techniques like k-means and hierarchical clustering. That is it for now. Thank you.